I-E-L-T-S class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Budapest here in Central Europe, capital of Hungary. I hope everybody is having a fantastic weekend so far, staying healthy. Hi, Angelina. Uh, this is a members chat class. Everybody's welcome to watch, and the class is presented to you by aehelp.com. For academic IELTS, check us out there. That's aehelp.com, academicenglishhelp.com. For the general version of the exam, please check us out at g-i-e-l-t-s-help.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of those websites, we have loads and loads of great materials for you including practice exams, fully interactive courses, uh, and of course over 100 hours of HD video lessons, as well as opportunities to practice your speaking for free, um, as well as paid, and uh, you can also submit task one, task two essays. Hi Sammy, hi Hassan, hi Nazir, good day to everyone, welcome. Uh, this class members is uh, questions and answers, so this will be your chance to ask me some questions. It will be a first comes first serve. Of course, this is one of the benefits of being a member is you get these classes once every couple of weeks. Uh, while we wait for a few more of your fellow members to join in, uh, this is our academic IELTS website here at aehelp.com with the blue background. Uh, click that big red button to join the premium package or the green uh, try demo button to try it for free. And uh, for the general IELTS, it's the uh, same kind of layout, but with the green background. And again, click that big red button to join our premium package there. Uh, as well, you can download and link the apps. So for the aehelp.com website, download the app Academ Academic IELTS Help. Link the two together so you study from the same account. For generalieltshelp.com, uh, download and link the app General IELTS Help from your app store. I'm doing great. Thank you, Kyber, for asking. Hi, Hina. Hi, Jainil. Nice to see more students in the class. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, you can always reach out to me at adrian at aehelp.com. Members, if I miss one of your questions today uh, for some reason, you can always send that to me as well. And for those of you who like to uh, study from paperback books, uh, you can order our exam books from Amazon, uh, search for AE Helps Academic IELTS or GE Helps General IELTS. Uh, live streaming is Wednesday to Saturday at this time uh, for members and then in 90 minutes uh, we will have another class speaking part three and that's a usual class also. So uh, make sure to take note of that. I'll put up uh, next week's uh, schedule shortly after this class and we will have classes next week as per usual. All right, uh, so um, let's get into some Q&A session about IELTS. Um, I will do my best to give you some valuable answers. Uh, hi Elena, so go ahead students, ask me any question that you might have or that you maybe came across while you were studying or I know a lot of students look at uh, resources from other teachers, channels, schools, British Council, IDP, Cambridge, so on, and uh, you know, you probably have some questions. Uh, there are definitely some conflicting or even different uh, information uh, based on where you're looking, so hopefully I can shed some light on that for you. All right, uh, Sammy is off to the races with the first question, uh, Sammy says, in the writing exam, I have given a two-word answer where the correct answer is only one word, but the instruction says use no more than three words. Uh, do I still get the mark? Okay, uh, good question, Sammy. Um, so it's a very specific question, and it's a good question, Sammy. So Sammy is asking... Um, in uh, the, uh, I think Sammy, you said writing, but I think you're probably referring to um, the reading. 
uh, Sam, you, you wrote in the writing exam, but I guess you meant the reading exam, right? Because writing exam it's, doesn't make sense. So uh, I'm going to say in the reading or listening. I gave a two-word answer, um, but in the answer key, the correct answer is just one word. However, the instructions state uh, no more than uh, three words. And your question here, Sammy, is do I lose the mark? I think that's your question there. Um, so this is the answer. Uh, if you provided an unnecessary word or a word that uh, confuses information uh, or uh, creates incorrect grammar, you will lose that mark. Okay, so in many cases, Sammy, when the answer is one word, even if you can have three words, if you're putting more words, there's a chance that you're making a mistake. There's a good chance that you're making a mistake. In rare cases, the answer still makes sense and it is given that way. So in rare cases, if you have added a correct uh, adjective, for example, or adverb, um, the answer will be counted as correct, okay? So uh, it's really important, uh, Sammy, that uh, you review your answers like that and read the sentence with your answers, okay? Importantly, uh, read your fill in the blank or short answer, okay? questions with your answers to make sure that they are accurate and sensible. Okay, so when you have that kind of a question, Sammy, it could be one word, it could be two words, it could be three words. It's important that it makes sense and it's accurate. Okay, it has to be grammatically and information-wise sound and accurate, all right? Um, there are multiple versions of answers that are acceptable in several cases. You just have to make sure that they're correct, okay? So it's a long-winded answer for you, but that is the answer to that question, okay? Um, and the other point, of course, is make sure to pay attention to plural and singular. So does it need an S or no S, or does it need an article like a or an, okay, or no article? All right. Okay, um, so hopefully that's clear. Let's go to the next question. Angelina Quailho says, in task two questions, when it's asked, to what extent do you agree? You have to answer, I totally agree, or I partially agree. Okay, Angelina, that's a good question. Okay, so Angelina is asking uh, if the task two asks to what extent do you agree? Uh, how do I answer this, okay? So open question here works well. Um, all right, uh, in most cases, so this is the answer here for you, Angelina. Uh, in most cases, uh, the answer will be I completely agree or I completely disagree because of uh, point one and point two. Okay, so you'll find, um, uh, Angelina, that for most of these kinds of uh, task two questions, you're either going to be on one side or on the other side, um, just because that makes for interesting writing, and it's usually the truth. Um, so, let me just grab that. So, 
So yeah, so in most cases, your answer uh, will be, I completely agree, point one and point two, or I completely disagree because of point one and point two. Again, just so that uh, we have even more clarity, I'm gonna change the formatting here. Okay, um, so most questions, like the one that we were dealing with this past week about um, um, the power of uh, spoken communication is always uh, more powerful than uh, written communication. I would strongly disagree with that opinion because there are definitely examples where written communication can be more powerful than uh, oral communication, especially, for example, when there's a lot of information. We never talked about that, but if you have a lot of information, it's very difficult for people to sit for 10 hours and listen to somebody talking, as where if you have a long book, then uh, you can break up that information into five, six days of one or two hours of reading each day. And that's much more powerful and effective than trying to listen to someone speak for 10 hours nonstop. So clearly there are situations where written language is much, much stronger uh, or a better form uh, for delivery than spoken communication. So in that case, it would be a strongly disagree. It would be awkward to say partially agree. Okay. And um, just a little bit more on that. Angelina, because that's not just for task two questions like this, but it's also for speaking. I always advise students to stay away from partial. Okay, it is advisable uh, for students, academics, and professionals to stay away from I partially agree. Uh, as sitting on the fence, that's the idiom for this, okay, it's called sitting on the fence. Does not make for interesting conversation, uh, nor does it lead to development in most cases, okay? So this is one of the ironic truths of uh, our human existence is that yes, uh, most everything in the world is not black and white. Most everything in the world is a shade of gray. However, ironically, humans cannot view their world as shades of gray when we form opinions because that leads to stagnation. Uh, does everybody know what the meaning of stagnation is? And this is an important point in today's um, lesson here. I'm going to just increase the size here. I see that there's a font shift here, so I'll increase that. Um, everybody knows what stagnation means? What is the definition of stagnation? So I'm just going to throw a question back at you to make sure that you're still paying attention. Uh, Natalie Nikiforova says it's no development. Um, Angelina says it's kind of like steadiness. Um, yeah, to stagnate means to stay in the same point and not move forward or backward or in any place, just kind of stay without change, okay? Um, not moving Kyber is okay. An even kind of better way to think of stagnation is to remain the same without any change for worse uh, or better. Okay. And I'm sure most of you will agree that uh, stagnation is the least human quality. So humans are in constant motion. We're always doing something, even in our sleep. Uh, we're constantly doing uh, activities, our brain is working, we're moving around, our insides are moving, we're digesting. So from the day that we're born to the day that we die, we never stagnate, okay? Um, so uh, stagnation is a, a common um, 
uh, result of uh, sitting on the fence. So those kinds of ideas, Angelina, usually don't work. There are some uh, cases where you can use that in the task too, but they're rare, okay? You'll know that from the question, okay? You'll know that from the question. And that's right, Sammy, there's stagnant water. Don't drink stagnant water. Uh, stagnant economy is not a good economy usually either. So stagnation is not for the better. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of, um, and I'm gonna have to strongly disagree here. So I'm going to, uh, state something interesting here for you in just a moment. Um, so I strongly disagree with IELTS materials and teachers uh, who state that you should answer questions in task two, which ask to what extent do you agree with the phrase, I partially agree because this leads to boring literature and Um, I'm going to create some parallel grammar here for you, so just give me a second, because it leads to boring uh, literature and um, poor and stagnating uh, information. Okay, so there you go. That's my thesis statement. If somebody, so if my task two question students for the IELTS were, uh, many teachers explain to students that you should answer questions which ask for what, how, to what extent do you agree or disagree as I partially agree. My thesis statement would be, I strongly disagree with IELTS materials and teachers uh, instead of who here that is better because of the materials. Uh, that state that you should answer questions in task two, which asks to what extent do you agree with the phrase, I partially agree because this leads to boring literature and stagnating information. And then um, I would uh, de detail that answer in body paragraph one and body paragraph two. And I think that this way it would be much more interesting of a read and lead to more development uh, then uh, if I answered this with, I partially agree. Do you agree? Everybody's following me? That was some witty conversation there ignited by Angelina. So thank you for that question, Angelina. Um, so again, just be really careful uh, with that. And... Um, <laughs> Alexander says, I 70% agree and 30% disagree. Uh, by the way, Alexander, you're bringing up an interesting point. So Alexander says 70% agree and 30% disagree. Uh, don't do that either, students. So don't do like um, proportional agreements and disagreements because in a 250-word essay, that's virtually impossible to explain clearly. So 70%, 30%, or 80%, 20%. If you have a, like a thousand or two thousand words to explain that, um, okay. But in a 250, 300 word essay, that's a really challenging task, even for the most advanced um, thinkers and writers. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Okay, definitely wouldn't do that. So most of the time, students, just to you know, in a nutshell, most of the time, uh, to what extent do you agree or disagree? 95% of the time your answer will be I completely agree or I totally disagree with this opinion because of point one and point two. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's get on to some other questions. So good questions so far. Members, great questions. Okay. Let's get on to a few other ones. Okay. Um, bah, bah, bah. 
So Janiel says, can I use abbreviations in listening modules like February, Saturday, and so on? Yes, absolutely, Janiel. Just make sure that you're using them correctly. Okay, that's really important. So abbreviations are completely acceptable. I've confirmed that with several uh, IELTS examiners uh, again and again over the years. Uh, we've asked that directly from British Council and they've said yes. So 100% uh, yes it is, um, but just make sure that uh, you know the accurate abbreviations. So uh, Jai Neal is asking, um, are abbreviations acceptable in the listening and reading sections? Uh, not only are they acceptable, but I highly recommend them. Answer is yes, and even more so, I strongly uh, recommend using them uh, just uh, because they're faster. And there is uh, less chance to make spelling mistakes by accident. Okay, uh, importantly, make sure to know correct abbreviations um, like uh, what you're doing there Janiel with Saturday uh, like Saturday is like that and not uh, Saturday like that okay uh, days of the week Janiel are proper nouns so you have to capitalize it even the abbreviation okay it's very important if you write it like that you're going to get it wrong just the same as um, as with writing out the full word, okay? All right, um, let's see. Hassan uh, has a question. I'm gonna get on to that. Lots of good questions so far. Uh, Hassan is asking, when I do proofreading for my writing, it's not easy for me to spot my mistakes effectively. What is the best way to do proofreading in the exam? Hmm. That's a very good question, Hassan. So, Hassan is asking, how can I proofread my work effectively during the exam? And specifically here, I think, um, let's target task one, task two. I mean, you should be proofreading um, your work, even in uh, the, <coughs> just a second, had a sneeze coming on there. Um, all right, so <clears throat> you should be proofreading uh, your uh, listening section as well. If you're doing the paper-based exam, you get a chance uh, to do that for 10 minutes when you're transferring your answers, of course, um, and in the reading section as well. But let's stick to just task one and two right now. Uh, otherwise, it becomes a very, very long answer. So how can I proofread my work effectively during the exam in the writing section? Okay. Um, so my answer, Hassan, is um, manifold. Okay. Uh, proofreading is a skill. All right. So proofreading uh, takes practice. That's my first answer. Okay. So uh, proofreading takes practice. So you must do this at home regularly uh, before you sit the test, okay? That's kind of a ironic answer, but it's the true one, Hassan, where it's basically you have to pr practice proofreading before you get to uh, the exam. Now the second one, Hassan, um, okay, so I'm gonna give you some more applicable information here as well. So also, um, what part of your, uh, <laughs> thank you, Kyber. Um, what part of um, your uh, task, uh, so let me ask this differently. Um, what parts of your writing section are the most important to be accurate? 
So if you had to kind of rank order, like the most important, second most important, third most important, what are the most important parts where you definitely want to make sure that you're not making mistakes? Because if you do, it's going to lead to a lot of confusion and significantly uh, lower scores. So where do you really need to make sure that you're, you're being accurate? So Angelina says the introduction. Angelina, can you be more specific? Yeah, so Kyber, that's very good. So Kyber says even more specifically, it's the thesis, right? So even if you botch the hook and the background a little bit, you definitely don't want to botch the thesis. And Hassan, the other one is the overview in task one. Absolutely, right? Because that's your very first impression. Okay, so also keep in mind the most important elements of your essays to get high scores. And that means, uh, number one, uh, the overview of task one. Uh, because it is your very first impression uh, for the examiner. Marking your work, and it will set the tone of your ability. Okay, so um, depending on how quickly you write, how much time you have for proofreading, uh, allocate your time effectively and definitely when you're done your task one, done your task two and you still have maybe five, ten minutes uh, to review your work, then go back and check your task one overview first. Okay. If there are mistakes there, make corrections, all right? Because that's going to set the tone. It's your first impression. And as the saying goes, first impressions are very important, right? So um, it might also be a good idea to leave reviewing or proofing uh, task one uh, until after you finish task two because this will give you um, greater outside perspective, okay? So um, in a perfect world, you're proofreading hours or even a day after you finish your work. Everybody catch me on that? So when you're doing uh, work for university or college, I highly, highly recommend finishing your essays one day before the due date so that on the due date, you still have a chance to review and revise your work. The reason why is because our brain is kind of funny. Uh, when we finish a piece of writing and we review it right away, just like Hassan is saying, it's quite difficult to catch our mistakes because we feel really confident. We're like, yeah, I did such a good job. I'm done. And hey, there's like no mistakes. Spell check got the mistakes that I made and grammar check and off it goes to the professor and it's going to be a 95% A plus, I'm sure. And then you get back an 80% on the paper. And then when you get the paper back like a week later, you read it again and you're like, whoa, what, the, <laughs> what was I writing? How did I make these mistakes and how did I not see these? Does everybody, anybody have that experience where you thought you wrote a great paper, you gave it in, you got back a low mark, you read your paper again and you're kind of scratching your head like, did somebody rewrite my paper while I was away for the last week? Okay. Um, it happened to me all the time. Well, not all the time, but it happened to me a few times in university until I changed my uh, strategy, especially in year three and year four, where I finished my writing early, one or two or sometimes even more days before the due date. And then closer to the due date, I reviewed, caught all of those or many of those mistakes and then um, a lot better grades after on, right? So uh, unfortunately, in the IELTS, we can't do that because you only have that one hour, right? But what you can do, and this is a little bit of help here, is uh, don't review your task one right away. Uh, finish your task one, finish your task two, and if you have five, six minutes left to do a quick check, then go back, uh, read the overview, see if you can maybe fix it a little bit, 
make it a bit better. Yeah, I guess, Angelina, that, yeah, Sammy, it's, I'm sure it's a common shared experience for many of us. Um, and then, of course, uh, secondly, uh, review. So next, uh, make sure to review your task to introduction, especially your thesis. Uh, okay, ask yourself, do I have clear points? You might be able to still fix it real quick. Uh, are my points using parallel grammar structure? Okay, uh, is my spelling here correct? Okay, um, so that's what I would do. Okay, and then uh, number three is uh, think of that self dialogue between your reader and uh, your writer. Ask yourself. Is this all clear? Okay, so those are kind of my um, my points, Hassan. I, I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps out. Practice that at home. Definitely proofing is a very smart idea, students. So it's a good idea to write a little bit less than what you can do if you just write the full 60 minutes. So do try your best to save five minutes of your writing uh, section for proofreading. I think that's a really good tip coming from you, Hassan. Okay. I strongly recommend, um, that because quality is more important than quantity. And there's a very good chance. Uh, honestly here, I mean, this is a, a proof in the pudding students. Just keep this in mind. Okay. So keep in mind that with all the practice, I've had writing essays and teaching IELTS, and it's a fair bit, I'm sure as you can guess, IELTS, I still uh, proofread my task one and task two before uh, finalizing. And at times, uh, I still, of course, I'm human, I still make a couple of mistakes. It's extremely rare uh, that somebody writes a perfect piece of literature. Uh, even the most famous uh, authors and journalists in the world have editors help them and go through their work, okay? So it's very arrogant to think that you have a perfect piece of writing. Um, and um, it's very important to go back and spend that five minutes, okay? All right, um, so good tip there. Uh, so save five minutes for proofreading uh, before the 60 minutes is up for the writing section. And even if you're under the uh, word limit, So if, uh, if you're saying, well, Adrian, a couple students here might be thinking, well, Adrian, uh, for me in 60 minutes, that's just enough time to write 150 words for task one and 250 words for task two. Uh, then I would tell you, okay, you know what? Then uh, write 130 words for task one and write 220 words for task two, but save five minutes for proofreading and make sure that your 130 words and your 220 words have less mistakes and you will get a better mark than if you have task completion with mistakes. Did everybody catch that? That was a really important tip. And that's a fact. We've discussed this with a lot of IELTS examiners. Even if you don't have task completion, but you have significantly less mistakes, your band score will be higher. Okay. So that's a very important tip. All right. Good. Thank you, Angelina. Thank you, Kyber. 
Natalie, for confirming. That's a very important tip. All right. Okay. Uh, let's look at some other questions. Good, uh, good question there, Hassan. That was a nice, nice one for discussion for sure. All right. Um, Kyber's asking, can we use stative verbs in continuous form? Uh, yeah, Kyber, like, um, are you thinking of I'm loving it? <laughs> McDonald's likes to use it in their advertising. Um, yeah, you can um, in, uh, in speaking, okay? So uh, Kyber's asking, uh, can we use uh, stative verbs? Uh, in continuous form. Uh, for example, like I'm loving it. Okay. Um, yes, the answer, Kyber, is yes, you can in speaking, but not in writing. Uh, because it is often done in colloquial uh, speech, but not in professional or academic literature. Okay, uh, so in speaking you can, it's natural, we do it all the time, but you can't do it, you shouldn't do it in writing. Okay, it's awkward, all right? All right, and then Kyber's asking, how do I paraphrase the background in writing task two, um, I don't think you really need to paraphrase the background, Kyber, in um, task two. Uh, sometimes paraphrasing the question will give you a bit of the background. So that's a second question by Kyber. Um, how do I paraphrase uh, the background in task two writing? Um, the answer, usually this is not necessary. As you simply uh, write the background. Okay. Um, sometimes the background is the paraphrase of the question. Okay, so keep that in mind, all right? Okay. Okay, um, uh, Hina, very good question. Lots of great questions today. Hina Arshad uh, says, mechanical writing really reduces scores like firstly, secondly, in addition. Yeah, Hina. Um, so writing is um, an art form, writing is technical, okay? Uh, so writing in this sense is both beautiful and mechanical. Uh, you have to know what your goal is, all right, Hina? So Hina is asking, I think the best way to ask this, Hina, is uh, does mechanical writing, like um, stating firstly, secondly, uh, finally uh, reduce my scores? Uh, yes and no is the answer. And uh, here is where you can sit on the fence. It depends, <laughs> okay? So sometimes that is the answer, it depends. Uh, yes and no, uh, it depends on how you use these. Let's see who's been paying attention to classes or who is using uh, the full interactive course on the websites because I believe we talk about this there. Um, where do you use firstly, secondly, finally? What kind of essays use this type of writing? Okay, usually. Uh, so this is my question to you. What kinds of essays usually uh, use accurately the leading expressions, uh, firstly, secondly, thirdly, finally, okay? 
Uh, let's see if somebody can answer that for me. Again, there's a lot of information in those um, interactive courses on the website. I'm always surprised how so many people, and I mean, of course, we're humans, we're visual, go to the websites, they buy the premium package specifically for the videos, and that's great. But the interactive courses are really wonderful, and a lot of people don't use these enough. Hemant says opinion essays. Not so much, Hemant. Not so much. Okay. Um, opinion essays can use them, but it's weak, and that's where you shouldn't use them. So in task two, I would recommend not using first, second, third. Okay. Think about it. First, second, third, fourth, fifth. Where would you use that mechanical type of voice? It'll. There we go. Janiel, very good. So um, did you get that from the full course? Janiel, just out of curiosity. Yeah, process essays, diagrams, expository process essays and diagrams. Yeah. So expository uh, process essays and diagrams as well as uh, flow charts. Okay, that makes sense. I'm sure you'll agree, right? So uh, uh, firstly, uh, the metal is heated in an oven. Secondly, the liquid metal is shaped into long rods which are then transferred to the cutting machine. Okay, next. Da, 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 da. Um, so yeah, expository essays, task one, that's where you might see this first, second, third, especially if you're looking at a process essay, and it's good there. In uh, persuasive essays, um, good, Jainil, yeah, I thought so, that's great. I'm happy that you're uh, paying attention to the interactive course. Uh, students, I know that IELTS can be kind of boring at times, but I really recommend you going through the interactive course on the websites. We've invested a lot of time effort, money into developing those courses. So uh, read them, read them. They're going to really help you, not just for IELTS, but also for school and professional life. And we're always developing them. So we'll have a new version coming out even later this year. Um, so make sure you look at those. Uh, persuasive essay students, okay. Uh, should avoid uh, the uh, cookie uh, cutter uh, mechanical language, okay? Uh, it will cost you marks. Or better said, you will not get as many marks as you can using better leading expressions and connectives. Okay, so uh, definitely students, um, the on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, firstly, secondly, thirdly, a lot of students are misusing them. They're just using them because they think it's like a button that you just put in there no matter what the information is. And that's not the way it really works in good writing. In good writing, every word has to have purpose. You don't just state it to state something or you don't just state it to say, well, it's opposition and that's good enough. What kind of opposition? Is there a better way to state it? Is there a stronger way to state it? Is there a weaker way to state it? What's the relationship, right? So take your thoughts a step further, all right? So don't just get caught in these cookie cutter methods. Um, IELTS examiners, when they see those kinds of cookie cutter essays in task two, uh, they will only give a band seven, maybe 7.5 if the essay is absolutely perfect, like no grammar mistakes, no word choice mistakes, you're answering the question and you have these cookie cutter, like first, second, third on the one hand, and then they'll say, okay, I'll give you a seven, all right? You'll never get a nine that way, all right? Okay, um, so, good question. I hope that, hope that answers that one, uh, it was good. Okay, uh, so
I think I missed a couple of questions there from some students. So I'm going to see unless some of you are repeating. Um, so Hemant's asking uh, if we miss a couple questions in listening section one and two, how can we come back after uh, section three and four and try to make a guess. Uh, for some questions you can, for some questions you can't. Okay, so if I make or if I miss uh, questions in the listening, so this is Hamont. I'm going to try to cover a couple more questions real quick here uh, for you students. If I miss questions in listening, uh, how do I answer them? It depends on the question, of course, but uh, use logic and uh, do your best to infer the answer uh, from context. Okay, that's all you can do. I mean, if time has passed and you really didn't hear it, then the best that you can do is use information from the other questions, use information from your own life, from your own experiences, and try your best to get it from uh, context, okay? So Alexander is asking, when should I devote a paragraph to each side and two paragraphs to one side if I'm asked which side has more advantages or another disadvantages questions? Okay, uh, it's a good question, Alexander. So Alexander is asking, uh, when do I devote uh, paragraphs to each side of an argument uh, and when do I do so uh, just for one side? Okay, I'm going to try to keep that short. Um, the answer is if the question asks you to discuss both sides or discuss both the advantages and disadvantages, then you likely need to devote a paragraph for each. Now that can change a little bit depending on the question, but Alexander, if the question asks you discuss both sides or um, discuss the advantages and the disadvantages, then you will likely have one paragraph for each of those. However, if it doesn't, okay, so however, if the question asks uh, which side do you agree with or um, are the advantages more than the disadvantages then you likely will just do two strong points for one side with one paragraph for each, okay? So um, if it's just kind of asking you for one side, so you really have to pay attention to the question, Alexander. I hope that makes sense. I mean, Alexander, I could talk for about the next 20 minutes just clarifying that more and more. Uh, Alexander, there is um, a blog that deals with that. Let me just show that to you real quick, students. So uh, check out these blogs, and I'm adding lots of information here as well. So this will kind of uh, help you out. So Alexander, go to the uh, website, log into your My Student account. It can be the free one or the paid one, doesn't matter. Okay. And then once you're in your My Student account, um, in the uh, top uh, right here, you see the blog. Hopefully that's clear. Yeah. Okay, so you see the blog, so you click on that blog. There's also forums there. And then uh, there's a lot of different blog headings, okay? Um, lots to go through there, students, lots and lots. 
Uh, and uh, there's vocabulary, there's uh, IELTS student success stories, and so on. But the one for this specifically is uh, this one here, uh, Alex. So uh, IELTS task two writing, question types, answer strategies. Uh, when you click on the uh, read more there and open that up, then uh, you will see a nice long explanation for that and even some questions and answers at the bottom. So uh, read through that. And this is where I can say that the written word is more powerful than the spoken word because I simply don't have time to read all that for you right now. But you'll find it there, Alex, okay? So that's the heading you're looking for. Task two writing, question types, answer strategies, okay? All right, let me brighten up our day here a little bit. Let me get back to the darker background. All right, uh, so let's see. Um, so Beckjen's asking if the number of words in task one and task two become a lot, <laughs> will it affect my score? Uh, not negatively, as long as you're accurate. Back, John. So, um, students, the uh, instructions for task one and task two is at least 150 words for task one, and it's at least uh, 250 words for task two. So, if you don't write that many words, they count your words. Yeah, actually, they do count your words, okay? So, if you don't write 150 words, if you don't write 250 words, that will negatively affect your score. It will be considered task incomplete. But, Beg John, if you write more words, uh, that will likely be a positive as long as your writing is clear and accurate. Keep in mind, students, I've said this before, that Band 8, Band 9 IELTS candidates will likely write closer to 200, 250 words for Task 1 and 300, 350 words for Task 2. Okay, they'll go into deeper explanations, um, more um, detailed answers, more elaborate uh, examples. So uh, more is better as long as it's good quality writing. You have to balance quality with quantity. Back, John, you have to balance quality with quantity. Okay, um, students, I'm sorry if I didn't catch all of your questions. Uh, I know there's lots, and I'm sure that they can uh, keep, keep on... Uh, Coming. Um, that's why we have these classes for you. Uh, save your questions for the next Q&A session, or if it's really uh, burning in your mind, then you can always send it to me by email as well. Uh, for all of our viewers to get loads of help with the IELTS exam from um, professionals who not only deal in education, but also in psychology and psychology of learning, myself included and a couple of my colleagues, uh, please visit us at aehelp.com for academic IELTS and gieltshelp.com for general IELTS. Sign up for our premium packages and get on your way to improving yourself for the IELTS exam, but also improving yourself for uh, your future school, uh, life abroad, and your workplace. Uh, happy learning, everyone, and hopefully I will see you in 30 minutes for Speaking Part 3 Practice and strategy. Uh, thank you, Angelina. You're very welcome. Kyber, welcome. Natalie, Beck, John, Alexander, everybody else who is present. Uh, my pleasure to help. Bye for now. Much love to all of you.